Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the February Astro Cafe uh, this evening. My name is Luca Vanzella. I'm the coordinator of the Astro Cafe series on the third Wednesday. Uh, I think it's the third Wednesday of the month um, as part of our regular Wednesday uh, Astro Cafe series. And tonight, uh, we're pleased to have with us from Toronto, uh, Blake Nancaro, who is with the National uh, Observing Committee. And uh, he's going to talk to us this evening about the uh, RAFC Observing Certificate Program. Uh, Blake is kind of like me, a child of the space race. And uh, he's developed an early interest in science and astronomy. Um, and he bought his first telescope in the 90s and join the RASC uh, in the early 2000s. He is a frequent contributor to Sky News Magazine, which is Canada's uh, astronomy uh, magazine, well, now owned by RASC. And he writes columns uh, for the journal and, and the Observer's Handbook. So he's a longtime member of the National Observing Committee and uh, he's developed a, a, a presentation that, a lot, that is, introduces people, uh, members to the various observing certificates that are available uh, for the uh, uh, within the RASC, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Blake to this uh, to this Astro Cafe this evening, and um, he will. I'll turn it over to you, Blake. Thanks for the introduction. Hopefully, you can hear me, see me, okay? Yeah. Yes. So. Um, uh, this evening, I'll talk briefly about the types of, of certificate, observing certificate programs that we have. We have eight, eight now, eight, eight or nine, depends on how you sort of count things. And uh, I'll also talk a little bit about how to do observing from the point of view, if you are going to pursue our certificate programs and are seeking that certificate in particular, sort of what, what we at the National Observing Committee expect, uh, how we encourage you to uh, collect information and then su submit that to us. Um, we're gonna do questions at the end. So uh, uh, if something occurs to you, uh, type it into the chat right away so you don't forget or write it down uh, if you want and and we'll take all those questions at the end but i'll try to quickly sort of go through my um, slides or content here um Lu luca thanks for the introduction again luca mentioned i'm from toronto i, I actually live just north of toronto in the small town of Bradford, West Willenbury. That's the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Mississauga, Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples. And I'm honored to share this land with all these people and to share the sky above as well. Our National Observing Committee is kind of from all over Canada, coast to coast to coast. We have about 15 people. That's one of the larger committees in RAST and our members are a pretty accomplished uh, I I only hold one uh, observing certificate uh, but within our membership we have the most decorated uh, member Melody Hamilton has the most number of certificates of any member but to in total we have 25 and we have obviously hundreds of years of experience so we're all pretty passionate about visual observing and visual astronomy now uh, i'll put a card on the table don't get me wrong um here it's not that we don't like photography <laughs> my focus is on our visual observing programs if you're interested in getting certified for your photographic work uh that's not my department <laughs> but you could invite Stuart Hagee, who is my counterpart. He uh, runs the Astro Imaging Certificate programs there. So I'll, I'll focus on the visual things, but uh, I'm I'm very interested in photography myself. I am curious about you. Maybe people could react in the chat uh, for the Zoom session right now. I kind of have a couple of questions for you. Type into the chat 
box in our in our zoom discussion here. Uh, I'm curious about who present this evening already has a RASC certificate. And, and maybe some of you have more than one. I think I saw Murray in the list uh, uh, earlier. So I, I know he's got one. Um, so that that's sort of my first question who who here has them. Some some people actually might have certificates from other places. Our neighbors to the south, uh, the Astronomical League, they have tons of observing programs. So I know of a number of people that that have those have Astronomical League or AL certificates, and some people may have certificates from the British Astronomical Association as well. Uh, and another question I have for for you present is uh, who's maybe pursuing a certificate right now. Maybe you've just started, maybe you're nearly done. Uh, I'm curious about people that have uh, a project uh, in work right now. So share that information. I'm curious about sort of where, where you're at. Um, or, or we can talk about it later at, at the end. Here's a bit of history. I pulled the database and I extracted out the Edmonton members who have received observing certificates over the years. And if you can read that small printing, you can see it goes right back to 1987. That's a couple of years after uh, the uh, program started up. Uh, so you can see lots of people early on uh, jumping on the bandwagon. And of course, at the early stages, we only had the Messier program. So lots of Messier certificates. Um, and Murray, Randy, Arnold, Dennis, Bruce, they, they each hold two certificates. Uh, and you might see your name. And, and Edmonton was also one of the early adopters of our second observing program, the finest new general catalog objects, the finest NDC program. So you see the first one came in at 1995. So that's pretty good. Over 40 certificates by Edmonton members. But you can see it's been, I don't know, a little quiet lately. Uh, and that's part of the reason that I'm here and happy to talk about the programs, maybe to get people kind of fired up um, about it. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, but, but uh, just, just the certificate was awarded last um, year. So there's been a lot of activity over many years. Here's big picture. If you're interested in that, uh, here are all all of the awarded certificates by year since the beginning, from 1981 through to um, uh, last year, and actually the first couple that came in for 2022. I took that snapshot at the end of January, and you can see that last year was huge. Um, 68 certifications came on came in and that blew the doors off our uh, previous highs in 2003 and 2004. I am not taking any credit um, for that. Uh, we think that this um, has a lot to do with the webinars and and insider's guide programs that were done by Jenna Hines and John Reed and Chris Vaughn and Samantha Jewett. Um, they, in, in 2020, they were talking about the Explore the Universe program. So we saw a big uptick in that program. And, and then last year, they talked about the Explore the Moon. And Samantha would do a sketch for every one of their sessions. It was really neat. She just did it sort of on the fly. So you can see a huge increase in the both the binocular and the telescope versions of the uh, explore the moon. So, so those are big contributions we think to the interest in these programs. And we also have some videos on on our website. So we think people are enjoying those little videos to tell them how to get started. So, so uh, anyway, I'm thrilled. You know, it's really great to see more and more people um, observing. We we've set the bar pretty high now. I don't know if we'll be able to break that this year, but you can see already we've got some applications coming in um, for the new year. So it's pretty neat. Um, I I'm, I'm love playing with statistics and graphs and stuff like that. So let me tell you about our programs now. Uh, and uh, 
um, sort of encourage you to, to maybe take on one of these if you haven't already sort of start started it or or maybe you're not aware of some of the programs that we have uh, and and again why do we do this the observing committee is really sort of passionate about getting people doing visual observing just to obviously enjoy the the sky and the universe and the various celestial objects and so on right it it, it <laughs> i've been describing it as i'm in the business of giving goosebumps uh I, again, I like doing photography, but I also love looking through the eyepiece at some very distant object, a, a tantalizing galaxy or a very colorful double star or a, a quasar or something like that. And I get goosebumps uh, when, when I look at those, those very distant objects. I really enjoy that visceral sort of feeling when visually observing. So. We want to encourage people to do that and get to learn the sky and their equipment and and things like that. Obviously, for the observing programs, we need a record uh, to look at when somebody submits something. So we're encouraging logging and good logging techniques. Sketching is optional for our programs, but we heavily encourage that and. And in some cases, it's it's very sort of natural or easy. The double star observing program, for example, some some say what could be easier, put two dots on the page, you're done. <laughs> um, so, so uh, we encourage sketching, but again, that that's an optional thing. And, and we think that these things help the observer become uh, better at observing. That that when you get better at logging. You, you start to see more detail and then when you can see more detail your, your log notes become richer and if you do sketching they become uh, more intricate uh, so we're trying to build some skills and provide some good techniques and, and stuff like that so here's high level picture of all of our different programs there so how many is that that's some um, uh, eight but the explore the moon actually comes in two variants. You can use just binoculars or a telescope certificates that you could do if you wanted. Um, and, and let me just do a, a little jump sideways here. Uh, I'll fire up our website just to show you where you could find all this, this information. So I've loaded up our website um, here. And when you're at the main page, uh, or any of the pages, I guess, just look at, for the menu at the top, the observing menu. I'm hovering over that. I hope the drop down menu shows up too, that you can see it. It does. And, and we, we can see observing program and tips and expectations and so on. Uh, there's the astro imaging certificate that I was talking about um, before. Again, Stuart Hagee takes care of that. You can see we have an astro sketchers group and so on. If you go into observing programs, this is where you'll find all of these different programs that I just told you about uh, briefly. So there, there they are. Explore the universe, explore the moon, um, Messier, new double star program down at the bottom of the pile. It, this page has general information. We describe what is an observation, what do we consider is an observation. We, we talk about briefly high level steps to complete a certificate and to receive the certificate sheets. Some of our programs have pins. We talk about uh, a new method for submitting materials and lots of general information here. So this is your gateway. That's a really good page in the RASC website to be aware of, to find all of the information about all of our programs. And now I'll, I'll just jump into one of them while I'm here. I'll go into the Explore the Universe. Now you can see we've got specific information about this particular program. What well, what's required? How many targets are there? They go. Uh, there's the Explore the Universe. What are the required targets? What are the total available targets? Uh, it, uh, there's a, a link to uh, workbooks. You can buy a workbook or you can print them at home. Uh, and here are those I was telling you about. We have a nice little quick video on how to use. A planisphere 
for us, our star wheel, star finder. Uh, and we have videos about the beginner observing certificate programs. Nice little quick videos on how to get, get started. And at the bottom, remember we're on the Explore the Universe page, and usually at the bottom of a page, you'll find links to the various files. Say, say a log sheet, an example log sheet, or a guide to describe in detail how to complete the program. Explore the Universe has a bonus extra section if people want to learn a bit about variable stars. So that, that's a supplement um, that's available. And you can see this particular program is available in the two official languages. So that's a quick look at where to find everything on our website. I like this from the point of view that we've got something for everybody. We've got things for people just starting out. We've got um, things that require uh, darker skies. Uh, we have some challenging programs for people that want to dig deep and go after uh, much more difficult um, targets. So uh, something for everybody, for different types of instruments, and for different types of skies. Uh, let me go into them, each one of these, in, in a little bit more detail. So explore the universe. It's great for people just starting out, and you don't need a telescope. You could do this program with binoculars and, and just your eyeball. Um, so, so that's fine. I pointed out before that there's 55 targets that are required, but there, there is a total of 110 or, or a few extra objects uh, that you can pursue. So to do the minimum sort of qualification, 55 targets, um, as noted in our guide. Uh, but we, we do recognize when people do all of the observations possible. So we, we note that additional or extra effort when people do that. Regardless of the number of targets, the minimum or the full list, we provide a certificate and pin upon completion um, that's uh, lovely, suitable for framing and, and so on. We see mine just, just behind me, there's my um, Messier um, certificate. Uh, and um, again, not all of the programs, but a number of them have an attractive metal a pin for the lapel or your chili hat or, or something like that. A unique feature of the Explore the Universe program is it can be done by any human on planet Earth. There are no restrictions or requirements uh, that one must be a RASC member. So this is us trying to just get people excited about the night sky and, and learning about the universe around them. So members or non-members may apply for this program. Uh, now, uh, an important consideration of this program is that we do not want people to use the go-to capability of a telescope. Uh, so people that have an Altaz mount, tripod mount, simple camera mount with a small scope, um, or a spotting scope, or binoculars, uh, uh, people with a Dubsonian uh, uh, of a manual telescope, um, they're, they're sort of good to go. It, this might give the impression that if you have a go-to telescope, you can't do this program. I, I want to be clear about that. You, you can't. You Run what you brought. Use any equipment that you have. But we just don't want you to use the go-to capability in the hand controller or have a connected computer to slew to an object. We, we want people in the Explore the Universe program to find the objects by manually positioning to the objects. So if you have a go-to telescope, you can use it, but just don't use the, that built-in feature to, to find the object. Uh, that might put people off. They go, well, I won't be able to find the object. But a lot of these objects are very, very easy to find. One, one of the targets, for example, is the Pleiades. So find it with your eyeball. Aim the telescope, look through the finder. Both, I'm assuming the finder is aligned, co coaxially aligned. So we'll find it in the finder, get it in the center of the finder, look in the eyepiece, boom, you found the object. Um, there. If you have a go to telescope, just use the, 
panning, slewing buttons to move the telescope up, down, left, and right as needed to, to get um, the target in the finder, look through the eyepiece, and you're good to go. Because this, this program is available to the public, to anyone, we have a special application form, but that's linked, as I showed you, on the main page. So that's the Explore the Universe program. Um, e easy, great starter program, a great potpourri of uh, different sort of objects. Um, the Explore the Moon program is uh, uh, obviously focused on one particular celestial object. You can see, again, that there's two levels, that there's 40 targets that are required uh, using binoculars. Uh, if people want to pursue the telescope version of the certificate and receive not only the paper certificate, but the pin uh, using a telescope, there are 94 required targets. And there's a few bonus ones that people can do if they would like. A great thing about this program is you can do it anywhere, anytime, assuming you're not clouded out, uh, you can do it in the city. Um, light pollution is obviously not a factor. In, in fact, you might need a neutral density filter. Uh, to observe the moon in, in some cases. My final point, I want to be clear uh, about this. Um, it, it, I say this is the fastest program, just meaning that you, you could, if you had clear weather, you might get lucky and be able to do all, all the observations in one lunation cycle in one or two months, pr pretty quick. Um, there. Some of our other programs might take a year um, or a couple of years to to finish them, maybe longer. Uh, uh, but I, I don't want to suggest to anybody that you rush. Uh, we do not give special prizes for people finishing the certificate as fast as possible. <laughs> slow, slow down, absorb, absorb those photons, take your time, so, soak it in and enjoy the view. Uh, but that, that is one of the, again, one of the quick sort of certificates that people can achieve. The Messier catalog, again, that was our first one that we deployed, uh, obviously 110 objects. And then if you know about some of the Messier objects, you know that there's a combination object. So there's technically over 110 things that you can observe um, in this smallish telescope, doesn't need to be big. Uh, here and a lot of the objects can be seen in suburban skies, but some of these objects um, might be tough to see if you're right inside the city core, city limits with a lot of light pollution. So maybe maybe a couple of these targets you won't be able to view until you're in a dark sky location. At the bottom here, I note a distinction, and this is true for all of our other programs now that you can use a go-to telescope it's fun you can use the hand controller you can have a computer hooked up and you can go to the objects there and, and you would just indicate that as you complete your application form i i use the go-to method for uh, completing the program it's fine no problem with that some people want to find all the objects, though, by manual method, or maybe you have a Dubsonian, so that's your, your only option um, uh, there. Um, and and it, I'm biased. Um, I'm not one that sort of beats that drum that, you know, you must learn the sky and you must learn how to star hop and, and stuff like that. But I am so glad I know how to star hop. There's been many a time where the telescope has failed or the pointing model is off. And I've had to star hop to um, objects, and I'm glad I know how to do that. Um, so I'm, I really enjoy using those skills. Uh, uh, I just point out the distinction here, though, that if people want to pursue our other certificate programs by the manual traditional method, you, you want to have a little sit down, think about that, if it's going to be achievable um, to you. Uh, do, do you think you'll be able to get all of the targets done by manual method? So, some of them you might realize, boy, these are going to be really hard to find, and, and it would be so much easier um, to use the go-to capabilities of a properly aligned telescope. So it, it's kind of a decision you're, you're going to make maybe kind of early on. What, what path do I want to go? 
and, and you'll you'll want to try to stick to that. But we we recognize both both methods here. Again, this applies to all of our remaining programs. The finest uh, NGC program was our second observing certificate that we invented. Um, this was created by Alan Dyer. Uh, he assembled a list of 110, in deference to the Messier catalog, 110 interesting objects. And some of these are parked right beside Messier objects. It, it, you've maybe seen some of these things on some occasions where, where you go, how did Chuck Messier miss this galaxy sitting right beside these other uh, galaxies? So they're fantastic objects. They're really, really nice, me medium-sized aperture. Probably again for a number of these, you'll need darkish skies or very dark skies um, to see these. And again, we provide a certificate and pin upon completion. I did this program, but I don't qualify. Uh, when I decided to learn how to use the free telescope, free to use telescope at St. Mary's University, the Burke Daphne Observatory in Halifax, I thought uh, I need a project. Uh, I, I need a, a good set of targets to try and acquire with this telescope. And I thought, oh, finest NGCs, that'll be really fun. So I imaged all of the finest NGCs with the BGO scope. Took me four years, fantastic learning experience, but obviously I don't qualify because I imaged all of those um, targets. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I don't care, I'm not going for that, that particular certificate, but it was an excellent list there are so many fantastic objects um, on that. Uh, probably about half of them I've visually seen anyway, um, and, and I'll slowly work through the rest visually. Here's our new program, the Double Stars Observing Program. Uh, once again, 110 objects or targets, I should say. Of course, we're talking about pairs of stars, so there's 220 stars that you have to see in a, and identify. And, and again, like our moon program, you can do this anywhere, anytime, doesn't matter what the light pollution's like, you can do it in the city, you can do it in your driveway, you can do it in the backyard, where, wherever you want. Um, that maybe only the only sort of constraint here is you want somewhat good to excellent through to excellent scene. Um, the double stars need steady air in many cases. So, so Nice new program, again, available to everybody. Smallish telescopes um, can, can be used anywhere, anytime. Uh, that was launched, uh, Luca and I were talking about this. This was launched uh, in late 2020 and through 2021, we had our first three certificates. And just today I received uh, the fourth application, which I'll be reviewing in the next couple of days. A more, we're getting into the more uh, challenging programs now. The uh, Isabel Williamson um, uh, program has, you can see, 271 required objects and then an additional 177 challenges, so over 400 targets um, on that. Once again, can be done anywhere, but you need a, a medium-sized telescope, you need good seeing conditions, and you also sometimes need to wait for the libration to be correct. Some of the objects are right at the sides or edge of the moon, so you gotta wait for that perfect libration period um, to get some of those uh, some of those targets. But uh, that's for the Sirius Lunar Observer, fantastic program in, in terms of also helping you understand a bit about the geology and, and history and formation of the moon. We have a deep sky gems uh, target by uh, David Levy. Um, he plucked 150 targets from his observing uh, logbooks, uh, and these uh, some of these are stunning, really interesting. But a lot of these are faint objects and small objects, so medium to big telescope maybe is needed, and probably some dark skies for some of these targets. You can see what you're up against if you look in the observer's handbook. Um, you'll see that list is uh, published there. Uh, I've been feeling kind of lost, not lost, just sort of wondering what to do over the last year or so. I've, I've completed a lot of projects. Uh, I, I was sort of thinking what's next. Uh, and then light bulb, <laughs> hey, we, 
we've got this great observing program, the Deep Sky Gems, I'll do that. Uh, and, and as soon as I thought that, I went, wait a minute, how many have maybe I already seen? So I dug through my, my uh, life list and I viewed about 40 or 45 of these objects already. So I went, whoa, I'm two, a third of the way done. But I, I'm actually going to get a new lot of book. I'm going to start from scratch. I'm going to do all 150. So I'm really looking forward to this. And I know it's going to take me a while. It took me 20 years to do the Messier. So this might take me another 20, 20 years to, to finish it. The last part I'm going to tell you about is the Deep Sky Challenge program. And you look at the number of targets and you go, that's easy. 45 targets, that's easy. But some of these are really faint very challenging objects and you will definitely need a dark sky uh, some say that you need at least a, a 12 inch telescope um, to to get some of these objects done um, but some have said if you have very good sky conditions you can use a 10 inch telescope but there's also some super challenging targets on this like um a quasar that you, you might need a very big instrument um, to, to see some of these. Uh, I've viewed many quasars, and in some cases, I could only see those in a 20-inch telescope. So that's all of our programs. I'll switch gears here a little bit. I'll just try to go through this sort of quickly, um, how, how to observe. And again, this is from the perspective of us as the observing committee you know, what do we think an observation is and what do you, what are we encouraging you to capture in your notes that you then provide for review. Um, so I'll talk about how to observe and and this is good for people just starting out, you know, what do I do, where do I start, um, how, how do I do a, an, ob, an observation. Uh, uh, so, and I'll talk about a little acronym that we use, LER. Uh, I'll speak generally here, but be aware that each program uh, has specific requirements. Obviously, if you're looking at double stars, we we're, you see in terms of color, we're not asking you questions about color or anything like that. So each program obviously is a bit a bit unique. But I'll I'll speak sort of generally here. What is an observation? We think that an observation is a brief description of what you see or a, a well annotated sketch um, a, a, an annotated sketch my, my feeling of that is it it has a a, a a basic sketch of the object an indication of maybe the directions west and north um and, and then some notes off to the side the eyepiece the sky conditions maybe, maybe um, some arrows pointing some part to to some parts of spiral arms, dark lane uh, here. Uh, so so that's sort of what we kind of expect in terms of a, an annotated sketch. So something recorded in some fashion, uh, and we feel very strong about this, and certainly I enjoy this um, that you're making memories with a, a good observation, a good note. Um, a nice sketch. Again, sketching is optional. Uh, those can bring you back into that moment. You live that experience. I keep I keep very detailed notes. I do limited sketching, but I really enjoy going back into an old note when I maybe I couldn't see something the first time I tried, but I, I finally achieved it at a latter latter date. So. So that's good. And again, we think it's a bit of a feedback loop that if you um, work at logging, then you start to see better. You're pulling out more detail. Again, we said don't rush, linger. Um, uh, start to use advanced techniques like averted vision and you see more and then that maybe goes into your log note. And then the next time you view a similar object, you're, you're getting better at coaxing out those faint details and so on, save a, a face on galaxy. So linger, soak in those photons, and just try to describe what you what you see as best you can. Now I talked about LER before, L stands for locate, locate the object. And there obviously there's lots of different ways that we can do that. Um, you can use paper charts, lists, uh, uh, planning software tools and so on. Wait, wait, Blake, you said you can't use computers 
<laughs> well, um, uh, I, I use computers for charting purposes all the time. Uh, we don't care what you use for the chart. Again, if you're going to pursue the traditional method for a certificate program, we, we don't want the go to function to be used there. But you can use whatever you want to help you find those objects or know you're in the right area. Again, I often have pointing problems with a lot of telescopes that I use, so I have to do field identification. So I use detailed charts, and then I'm moving with the eyepiece to make sure I'm in the right area. And don't forget to use low magnification when you're first starting. The LER, the E stands for examine, and this, I'll just let you read those things there, but that's just us, again, wanting you to dwell, linger, soak in the view, think about what you're looking at. When you look at the observing sheets or log forms that we suggest for the programs, we'll tell you about the kinds of things that we'd like you to record or capture. Uh, but there's a lot of common details in, in the, those cases. But, you know, if you're looking at the moon, what sort of surface details do you see? If you're looking at a galaxy or there nearby faint galaxies, what's in the field, what's unique or special about the thing that you're looking at. And record that. Here, here's an example of the log sheet um, form or template from the double star program. I don't know if you can read the printing there, but we ask about how close or far away are the stars from one another, what are their colors, usual stuff, date, time, location, sky conditions, um, and then lots of space for detailed notes. Somebody here filled it right to the brim, lots of detailed notes, and then a nice little sketch with a couple of uh, annotations on it, uh, including the power of the magnification. So that, that's a very detailed note, um, but that gives you some idea as to what we're interested in seeing. I use an audio recorder when I'm at the telescope. I'm trying to keep my eyeball um, in the ocular as long as possible, so I'll just dictate or speak everything that I'm seeing, and then the next day I'll, I'll convert it or I'll transcribe it. Uh, once you've completed all your target objects um, and you've assembled things, and if you can put things in the order that they were in the program, that helps out the reviewer a lot. So get all your notes ready and assembled and collated and, and find the application form and complete that. The, I'm showing the Explore the Universe application form, which has the affidavit portion filled out by the applicant and then has an authentication. So one person uh, has a, a review or a look at the, the notes uh, prepared by the observer. The, the big distinction between all of our other certificates is that we ask that two people authenticate the work done by the observer. So fill out the appropriate application form and then you're ready to uh, submit that. Um, there may be a local representative or maybe a few members that can do uh, the review process within your center. Uh, but if nothing else, reach out to us at the observing committee and, and we'll help you with that process. And more and more people are using electronic mechanisms now. So a very popular method that a lot of people are using, they simply scan or photograph their logbooks. They upload it to their shared service that they use, maybe Google Drive or iCloud or Dropbox or something like that. We have an uploader service if you don't have your own tool so we can transfer the files that way. Please don't email um, the files in. They can be way too large. Um, they may not go through. And then upon completion of the review process, um, we obviously we recognize the accomplishment We'll prepare a certificate. Those get printed and sent out from national office. Again, some of our programs have pins, so we'll send that along as well where relevant. And we also like to note people on various channels uh, in, in the RASC bulletin, in the annual report. Uh, we haven't done a lot lately, um, but uh, we, we have also posted, if people are comfortable with it, on our social media channels as well. So you get to see your name and lights and, uh, um, and people can print, uh, prepare their certificates and hang them up in your office or in the observatory or something like that. 
I showed you this already, the program information. So simply go to Rask um, and, and then go into the observing menu and, and you're on your way. And I'll just close off with a couple of uh, thoughts here, um, just some random points. Uh, for people that are just starting out, maybe you, you've selected a program, you've done the first couple of observations, and maybe you're a little nervous. You're going, am I, am I doing this right? It, or maybe there's something on the log form. You're going, I'm not sure what this means. Or, or maybe you don't know how to gauge, say, scene conditions. If you're looking for some clarity, some comfort, uh, please reach out at the very early stages. Maybe send us a sample or two, your first, your first two observations, uh, and we'll have a look at them. Um, and, and we'll tell you if you're on the right track, if there's anything missing. It'd be a shame that you've got 108 or 109 observations done and you discover you, you overlooked something. Um, so, so reach out at the early stages will help. Some centers do mentoring. They, they get a new observer connected with uh, uh, an experienced observer, and, and that um, new person can be mentored um, by the, the uh, veteran. So there are lots of ways to sort of help in that way. Um, I also want to emphasize that the observing certificates are an individual effort. Uh, that means if maybe some family members or a parent and a, and a youth want to work on the program together and each be certified, that's good. That's a great thing, actually. We're working through the a program together, but we need two log books. And, and if you were pursuing the manual method um, using a Dobsonian and pushing the scope around, uh, each person needs to find each object. So think about a strategy. I've got a few ideas how, how you could sort of uh, do that effectively, but we want two log books. We want each person, when you're going the traditional method, to find the objects and so on. I hope that makes sense. And a very common question we receive from people is, can I have my camera hooked up in my telescope, um, get to the object, photograph the object, and then describe the object from the photograph, uh, and, uh, and then that's my log entry? Um, very common question. And the short answer is, no, we're sorry. Uh, we, we want, we're about eyeballs to eyepieces. So we want you to visually observe. Um, the object, and it's your impression, you, your impression of the visual representation of what you see in the eyepiece, what, how your brain is processing that, and then recording that, um, that examination and reporting, that's what we're really interested in, in the visual observing program. So you, you can include a photograph with your log notes, but we want to know that you viewed the object with your eye um, as well. You, you could have both in there. I, I did that with my Messier. I would view the object and some of them I had photographed. Um, so to me, it was just enhancing my um, log notes, but it, the, it was primarily the log note and sketches um, that were in my uh, submission. So hope that makes sense. And I think that's all. Um, lots of people helped me uh, assemble this presentation. I use lots of tools, so thanks, kudos to all those resources and uh, people. Thank you. And uh, I thank you for your time. Remember, again, quite simply go to ras.ca and look in the observing section. You'll find more information. The email that I'm showing there, observing at rask.ca, that will reach me. So if you have any questions after the fact or you're getting started in, in a new campaign, uh, again, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, that's uh, that's it. I'm happy to take. Uh, how did I do in terms of time, Luca? Oh, you did very well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Blake. That was a very uh, informative and entertaining uh, presentation on the certificate programs. 
Um, actually, some questions did pop in on the chat while you were presenting. Uh -huh. So I thought I'd go through them with you and then you could maybe sure. answer them. Great. Uh, first question that came up is, uh, uh, what is NGC? NGC stands for the New General Catalog. Um, that's a, uh, a very large catalog of uh, nebulae and um, uh, distant interstellar objects. Um, so a lot of galaxies um, that are in that. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact number, but I believe the NGC catalog has something in the order of 6,000 or 7,000 entries in it. And there's two supplements to that um, referred to as the index catalog or the IC. So sometimes you'll see IC and numeric objects uh, also with NGC objects. So new general catalog. Um, huge uh, catalog um, produced with many, many galaxies um, in it. And again, Alan Dyer sort of selected from that what he felt were the 100 best or the 110 best ones or really interesting ones. And, and he tried to mix it up. There's planetary nebulas, there's galaxies, open clusters, uh, and so on. All right, thank you. And Marion wants to know if you have to choose non-go-to or, or choose non-go-to or go-to for the whole list for the Messier NGC. I was thinking of doing manual for whatever I could and only using go-to if needed. So okay. do you have to stick to one method or can you mix and match? What we would, if you completed um, the program and then submitted that, we would designate that as a, uh, a, a go-to certificate because some some of the entries were found by go-to method. So I, I guess the answer is you have to do all of the objects by the manual method to achieve the traditional manual recognition on the certificate. You, okay. it, it's a good question though, in the sense that you can use both um, me methods Try, try your darndest to, to do all the ones manually. We, we appreciate that effort. You, it's really you though, that will benefit from that. So find as much as you can manually by, by star hopping. Um, and that's an admirable effort. But there, some people might get really stuck and they're going, what am I gonna do? And, and they can't find a particular object by star hopping to it. So yeah. Tricky, but but uh, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Michael wants to know what is averted vision. You mentioned that term. Um, uh, briefly, averted vision is not looking directly at the object. So an example might be something like a galaxy. Let me go back to that. Um, sketch that's in the deep sky gems it, just as a kind of a an example of wh where i would look or or reference things uh, so that's this one so let's let's say you've uh, reached this target and you you know you're on the target by the star pattern say you're comparing that to a paper or a computer atlas, and you, you know you're in the right area. Um, and, and those little four stars there, and that little pattern over there, you know you're in the right spot. Uh, and, and you look right in the center of the field, and you can't see anything. You know, that's weird. There should be a galaxy there. But if you put your eyeball maybe over here, if you make a point of looking, say, right there, concentrating or focusing your eye at that point, then all of a sudden this galaxy pops. You, you don't see it. Now what's going on? This is a physio physiological thing. That in the in the center of each eye um, is a dense collection of cells in the retina that actually produces a bit of a blind spot. Uh, normally we don't 
detect that or notice that that happening because we're using both of our eyes at the same time. So we get coverage, we get oversampling with binocular vision. But when you're using one eye in the telescope, the blind spot becomes a factor. And when there are faint objects, you, sometimes they disappear. So you might look directly at that galaxy and it disappears, but you see this one and this one, no problem. So averted vision is putting your eyes focus in a particular place. Maybe it's over here, maybe it's over here. Um, and, and it will make these these galaxies suddenly appear. And in some cases, you, you actually realize, whoa, that galaxy is huge. This sketch, you can just see there's a little bit, but there's kind of some fuzzy stuff going out this way. You know, and there's kind of a, a, a halos around these galaxies. So averted vision can make the very, very faint parts of the galaxies pop up. So maybe you look, you focus right on the core and you see the faint fuzzy stuff show up. So averted vision is deliberately moving your eye off the target to make more data be revealed. Um, and, and what you're doing is getting, getting your eye to be in a position where the blind spot is not right on the object that you want to look at. I don't have it handy, but look it up, do a, an internet search for blind spot testing. And it's a fascinating experiment that you can do at home on your computer, basic sort of monitor, and, and they get you to look at a point um, in the screen and they're gonna, they flash uh, dots um, uh, for a short time on the screen. Um, and as each dot appears, you indicate if you see it or not. And you keep your eye centered at that one designated position. And after all these sample dots are displayed randomly, then it will show a pattern of where you couldn't see the dots. Uh, so it's really neat. You'll learn where your blind spot is for your particular eye. It's actually a, a good thing to know um, for the astronomer. That's a very advanced uh, technique, but averted vision is a, a great, great tool. Yeah, it is indeed. Actually, uh, the I think it's I think it's on the finest NGC uh, list. There's the uh, blinking planetary nebula. I think it's on that list, and that is one where if you do the inverted vision on it, you get a very noticeable effect where the uh, the planetary nebula yeah essentially disappears uh, or it, comes back very prominently. You've got this nebula, and there's there's a star in the center. So right, it my experience is I can see the nebula. And when I look right at the center, the star in the center disappears. Right. But, but if I look over here, then I can see kind of off in my periphery, I can see the star. <laughs> so right. but it works on planetary nebulas, it works on galaxies, it works on galaxy clusters. Uh, uh, I use it for double star observing. I kind of use it for, for a lot of the deep sky observing that I do. A simple thing to do is just keep the eye moving, move your eye around, look at the whole field, don't look in dead center. Right, and and sometimes uh, on the really really faint ones, uh, uh, tapping pat, tapping the eyepiece slightly to make yeah. it vibrate makes it makes the view jiggle a little bit, and sometimes with the with the extra motion, you mm -hmm. can detect uh, the object. Yeah, or grab the hand controller and put it in the slowest speed and slew a little bit up, down, left, or right, just slew in one direction, and, and you go, whoa, this object is really big. As soon as it starts moving, um, you, you'll see there's greater dimension to it. So we, right. we have a trick, this, this is a weird thing, right? When we use a telescope, we're using half of our visual faculties. <laughs> All right, another question from uh, Adam is, uh, are there any restrictions on, oh no, that's the one you answered on that. So that, sorry, that you answered it about the photos representing the uh, observation. Uh, another uh, question from Greg is, uh, what RASC, RASC guides, tools, or books, et cetera, should I acquire as a new observer planning to explore the universe and the moon? Uh, There's actually yeah. two questions, I'll, I'll start with that one first. So there, uh, let me jump into the store. 
on here. I was just looking at this today. Uh, that looks weird. Um, where's the store? Where's the store? There it is. Oh, why is this so huge? <laughs> there it is. Right. So here we go. Um, uh, we have a publication called the Explore the Universe Guide. And uh, that was recently revised. So you can see the third edition is available. And um, it, uh, it talks about the whole Explore the Universe program, has a lot of the forms and uh, materials in it collected all in one place. But there's also a, a number of uh, chapters that talk about how to observe and and uh, how to do things like calculate eyepiece power and stuff like that. So it's a quite a good primer um, to for people get, getting um, started with the Explore the Universe. So that book's available, um, and that's in the Rask uh, online store. Um, the the book by John Reed, 50 Things to See with um, the Telescope, uh, this isn't uh, uh, sort of a tight fit with the Explorer of the Universe, but it's a very good book with sort of the same goal, um, it, using a small instrument, getting started with observing, how to observe, uh, uh, and and many of the objects that are in that book are ones in the explore the universe program but it doesn't it doesn't cover everything obviously it's it's a just in terms of a sheer count you can see it's a, a smaller number than the minimum but that's also quite a good book and it has a lot of sort of self-guided activities in it um, again it's not it doesn't dovetail with the explore the universe program but a lot of the principles are going to be the same that's uh produced by john Rio and um uh the maritimes so those are a couple of books off the top of my head that might be good for this yeah okay very good um greg's got a second question but i think that will uh, i'm going to um leave it to after this next one because I wanted to share my screen to answer that one. Um, but we'll, we'll continue with uh, another question. Did you say we can use filters or do we need to work without them? There is no restriction. We, we impose no restrictions on filtering. What, what I had suggested was that if you're doing the lunar campaigns, you may want to use a neutral density filter just to cut brightness. Um, so that's just a suggestion. You use an ND filter if you want. Uh, sometimes you're looking at the moon, uh, uh, say in the Isabel Williamson, you're using high power and you're on a part of the moon and it's fully lit. So you're going to have a very, very bright view out there. So some people use polarizers or use uh, neutral density filters. Um, there, but there's no filter requirement. You don't have to use them. If you have some though, as you well know, these may good, be good for various purposes. Colored filters can reveal features on planets. Uh, some of the new modern filters like light pollution filters, I'm not super familiar with all of the the sort of current crop of filters, but there's lots of light pollution filters. Those might be incredible for people that are working in in the city limits and they're trying to coax out a bit more detail. Uh, so so those might be advisable to use in those sort of situations. And I have a an oxygen filter that I often use when I'm looking at planetary nebula. So that pulls out a lot more detail. That's okay. And you would record that in your logbook. I viewed Planetary Nebula X uh, visually, no filter, difficult to see, popped in the O3 filter, and it was huge. So 
very pleasing view with the oxygen filter. That's a great log note, you know, what, what you were trying and what you were doing to, to pull out some of that detail um, for that more challenging object. So we don't ask you to use filters, but if you got them, use them and, and tell us what you use. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was good. If you don't mind uh, unsharing your screen, I'll get to the next question. Uh, there's a question uh, about, are there any mentors in Edmonton uh, or sky watching events planned for 2022? And in order to answer part of that question on mentoring, I just wanted to bring up uh, the Edmonton RESC website. So edmontonresc.com is the uh, local center uh, website. And currently, uh, if you scroll down on the main page to see the events, you see tonight's Astro Cafe listed. And below that, you'll see two upcoming uh, Wednesday night series events. One is called uh, Introduction to Stargazing in the Universe. This is a series uh, that uh, Alistair Ling runs. Uh, and it's a, uh, it's a beginner low, uh, low intensity um, primer on, on introducing uh, beginners to stargazing uh, with the intention of kind of working th uh, their way through the Explore the Universe um, uh, certificate. And uh, these are recorded and all the past uh, uh, cafes are available on our YouTube channel. And the next one coming up is on February 23rd. So that acts as sort of a, uh, a monthly uh, on the uh, fourth Wednesday of the month uh, program uh, in that regard. There's also one at the beginning of the month and the next one's scheduled for March 2nd. Uh, Jeff Robertson does a, uh, a review of, of uh, what one can see in the night skies over Edmonton during, uh, during the upcoming month. And then he also throws in some space history uh, uh, to boot. So Edmonton Center doesn't have an official mentoring program, but those two series of cafes uh, that run on Wednesdays are, uh, are regular and uh, you can catch up with the past ones on our YouTube channel, which is available on the social media links. In terms of sky watching events planned for 2022, we're hoping like most centers, I think across the country that uh, 2022 can actually have more events in person for sky watching rather than strictly virtual events. Um, these are generally advertised uh, on uh, e uh, either uh, our Facebook uh, group uh, or the Twitter. Uh, and there's also a old school mailing list called the Astro List, which you can join. Uh, if, and so anything that is, that is planned for like sidewalk astronomy or international uh, astronomy day in April, those kinds of things. If we ramp up to do those this year, they'll be advertised on, on the website, uh, including the, uh, the, the annual star party in September out at Black Nugget Lake. Uh, campground. So you just watch the main page of the website or subscribe to the Facebook group or, or get the Twitter feed and any any events that are organized for, for sky viewing are generally announced uh, on those feeds. And uh, let's see, did something else come in? Okay. All right, back to you, Blake. Uh, is there any, uh, th oh, sorry, if there's any more questions, you could uh, type them in. We've still got time. We don't have a hard stop on here if there's any more questions. And I'll turn it back to Blake if he's got any other uh, things Thanks. to Just say. A, a quick comment that I wanted to make about the um, what you were talking about with Alistair. Alistair and I were talking a few days ago, and he told me that he had done a little bit of work on that program to make for better alignment with the Explore the Universe. So, so that was great news. It, it sounds like um, it's an opportunity to observe together and learn together and, and start chipping away at some of the targets on the Explore the Universe program. Yeah. Right. And it's the Q&A sessions are also good if you're having a specific problem with an object or a technique or something like that. Either Alistair or other people that are uh, attending uh, yeah. The, the event uh, can, uh, can, can provide answers and sometimes it's timely because these, these, between that one and the what's up there's, uh, you get it every, every couple, you know, every two weeks or so there's, a, there's an event. It'll be so good when we can start observing together again. Um, and and, and some, some things are just very 
obviously naturally and easily sort of conveyed and we can help people with when, when we're able to, to be together. How, how do you teach averted vision? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if there's a way to do that. I, I came about it by a weird sort of other hobby. Um, so I, I knew about sport vision and active vision and, and stuff like that and knew a bit about the already the physiology of the eye. So when I read or heard about averted vision the first time out, oh, I know what that means. Um, so, <laughs> but for a lot of people, yeah, it's, it's challenging or new or unusual. Um, I, I, I don't think I uh, have anything else. I'm just sort of looking through my notes to see if there's um, any other sort of interesting key, key points that, that sometimes I share. Oh, I, I uh, can show the certificates that have been awarded to the Edmonton Center specifically. You, you want to see that? Sure. <laughs> so I I had shown you before the the total number, right? Um, which uh, was here. But uh, if you're wondering where, where's Edmonton and all of this, it is here. So, uh, uh, obviously, if you have a big center, you you get more certifications presumably coming through that. So don't feel discouraged <laughs> that that Toronto is sort of blazing this trail here. But there, there's Edmonton with again, as I pointed out, over the 40 certificates. And, and you can see again, if you can make out some of that sort of um, scaling in the colors and stuff that the lion's share are Messier's. So you can see there's a few finest NGCs and a number of Explore the Universes and little slivers um, of a couple of the other uh, certificates. But that, I think if I count that right, that Edmonton has the their number six um, in that you know total number of certificates um, achieved out of all the centers. Uh, so that that's a sort of neat little stat as well that I pulled. Uh, just looking in my deck to see if there's a uh, one person asked if I would share the slide deck. So uh, I, what I'll do is I'll make a PDF version of it and I'll send it to you, Luca. Sure. You can sort of put it wherever you want to put it. I'm happy to do that. Um, do I have any hidden slides in here? Any other information? There. Here's the for the Astro Imagers. There, there's where you want to go. You want to go to the, again, just, you can just simply go to rask.ca and go to the observing menu and you'll see the observing certificate there. I show the direct link here. Uh, and again, Stuart Heggie sort of runs that. They have a number of different um, programs, a uh, number of different um, certificates, but there's three classes, wide field imaging, solar system objects, and then deep sky objects. Uh, it, there's a, a lot of requirements or specifications for that, so be sure to look uh, at those respective web pages for what you need to do. Uh, but they're, they're, it's an excellent set of certificates and programs, and they're very encouraging, and, and they help people um, ma master the skills uh, required to produce very good uh, images. So. Again, that's that's uh, another great program for people that don't own eyepieces, <laughs> but own cameras. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, it. thank you very much, uh, Blake. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in on the chat, and so we're uh, now coming up on, I think, over an hour of this cafe. So. I think uh, we can probably wrap it up here. Um, thanks again for taking the time uh, to, to present the program for us. Um, we did record it. Uh, this um, 
this presentation. And so we'll, uh, I'm going to upload it uh, to the YouTube channel for anybody who wants to watch it. And I think you mentioned there were some people on the East Coast mm -hmm. that uh, wanted to see it. In fact, somebody was just sent on the chat that they had come in from the East Coast, but we're logging out because we're getting kind of late over there. So yeah, so we did have at least one. So we'll post it on the YouTube channel. Uh, and then if you send me the PDF of the slide deck, I can put it in on the post uh, that uh, on the post for this particular cafe and it'll be there for anybody who wants to find it. Yeah, my pleasure uh, helping you out and I'm, I'm at your disposal. Anybody that has any questions about our observing programs, about the certificates, um, uh, details about individual programs, again, don't hesitate to reach out to me at any point. You've got, you've got that email. Uh, and I'm I'm happy to help in any way that I can. All right. Well, thanks again, Blake, and uh, to everyone attending. Hope you uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I wish everybody uh, a good night and some maybe some clear skies. We have right. the full moon uh, cloud effect happening over Edmonton right now with snow and clouds. So, but hopefully by a third quarter next week, things will clear up. Good night, everybody. Good night, Blake. Right.